declared a national emergency due to the extraordinary threat posed by Venezuela to the national security of this country. The executive order targeted seven individuals who were excluded from visiting the United States and he went on to charge Venezuela with undermining the democratic process, violating the rights of peaceful protesters, and interfering with free speech and peaceful assembly. I had two responses immediately. One as a U.S. citizen who has closely followed U.S. foreign policy since Vietnam. The idea that the United States could accuse another country of excessive force and corruption was mind-boggling. I wish I had time to show you Minister Louis Farrakhan's response to Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. I wish I could channel the passionate indignation that he had when what Mike Wallace suggested there was a country that was corrupt. Farrakhan said, the United States should keep its mouth shut. <laughs> as much hell as the U.S. has raised on this earth, spelled blood on every continent, millions of Native Americans to the atomic bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, hundreds of thousands killed in the Mideast, including 500,000 children who were starved to death for political reasons. Death squads in Latin America, dictatorships for decades, torture and rendition to this day, drones against civilians in violation of international law, meddling in support for coups in Venezuela, Honduras, Ecuador, Uruguay, Nicaragua, the list goes on. Clearly, this government has no right to speak to any other government on the face of the earth. There is no one more corrupt and no one that denies public assembly and exhibits violence against its citizens more than those in the United States. Just look, just look at the attacks on Black Lives Matter or just black citizens every day. Just look at the attacks and the violations of free speech against multiple Occupy movements or labor actions in this region. There is no more violent or corrupt government on the face of the earth. And this is what Farrakhan said, but this is what I'm saying. There is no US, there is more greater threat to world peace and human development than the United States. The executive order is just one more action, just one more small example of U.S. intervention in Venezuela, Latin America, and it parallels U.S. intervention in the Ukraine, the Mideast, and elsewhere. Response number two, I only had two. As a researcher in international communication who closely follows Latin America, global media, and political and social change in the region, my study, including several research trips, interviews with media workers, officials, and participants in missions in Venezuela, and a close reading of international press coverage, I would say Venezuela is not a threat. Venezuela may be a threat of a good example. The threat of a good example. And I notice that others agree. UNICER, the Union of South American Nations, voted unanimously to condemn the executive order. 33 nations at the summit of the Americas, blocked only by Canada and the U.S. 33 nations said withdraw that executive order. More than 10 million Venezuelans have signed a petition saying withdraw the executive order. Do you know that even the director of U.S. national intelligence will not describe Venezuela as a threat? The U.S. has tried to walk it back saying it's just standard language, but there's still 100 embassy workers in Venezuela working with the opposition against democracy. The threat in this hemisphere is U.S. intervention, U.S. interference. You want good examples? You want hope? Look at some of the accomplishments. ABC News reported that nutrition has doubled in the last decade in Venezuela. UNICEF reports that infant mortality has been reduced by a third. The Guardian newspaper reports extreme poverty has been reduced by 74%. UNESCO reports that illiteracy 
Venezuela was illiteracy free as of 2005. In fact, the literacy rate is greater in Venezuela than in the United States. You want an example? They've built 13 universities in Venezuela in the last 15 years, 30 million people. You know what they've done in the 38 million population of California? They've built 22 prisons. <laughs> 13 universities, 22 prisons. Who should we be afraid of? The Economist reports support for democracy in Venezuela is the highest in Latin America because they have a sense, this is The Economist, quote, that the government is acting on behalf of everyone rather than the privileged few. There's more. There's so much more that we don't know. And as a professor of communication and global media, I recognize it's not our fault. We get limited information provided by the commercial media. I ask, wouldn't it be great to get some information that was not distorted, that was not filtered, that was not framed by government sources and the ideology of neoliberalism by the New York Times, Fox News, ABC. Well, tonight we have the opportunity. Thanks to Dr. Felix Massoud, who arranged the facilities here. Thanks to the local committee, Chicago Stands with Venezuela, that invited our speaker and sponsored this forum. We have an opportunity to circumvent the media filter and that frame. Tonight we have a guest who can provide first-hand account, documented evidence of the progress, a political economic overview of the conditions faced in Venezuela, and discuss some policies to address both problems and opportunities. Our guest speaker, Maximilian Sanchez Arbalaez, has been serving as a charge d'affaires of the Embassy of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to the United States since last July. He was appointed ambassador to the United States in February of 2014. Um, he has not taken that position due to uh, some dispute with the U.S. government. He served as commissioner in international relations from 2013 to 2014 for President Maduro. He was the ambassador to Brazil from 2010 to 2013 where he received a medal of the Order of Rio Branco for distinguished diplomatic service. He was the Minister Counselor for the Venezuelan Mission to the United Nations from 2006 to 2007. Ambassador Sanchez is a lawyer with a master's degree in Latin American political science from the University Pantheon in Paris and did his postgraduate study in political science at the University in London. He joined President Hugo Chavez's government as a consultant in foreign affairs and then served as a senior advisor to the Office of the Presidency for two periods, 2004 to 6 and 2007 to 2010. Contributed to several international magazines, including Le Monde Diplomatique and Folha de Sao Paulo, among others, where his writing on politics in Latin America is regularly published. In other words, our speaker tonight is well-versed experienced and has the authority of an active participant and leader in the Venezuelan government. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Maximilian Sanchez Arbalaez. I said to myself, yeah, I should learn more from Professor <laughs> Technique, you know. Um, so thank you very much to be here tonight. Um, this is my first time in Chicago, I have to say. And um, it's funny because the Tommy is windy and it's raining and, uh, and it's true. <laughs> um, so 
uh, you know, when you read, professor, when you, you responded to a certain question, I was reading my, my little notes, and I said to myself, my God, you have seen everything I was going to say. Um, so, so, so yes, um, I'm going to start to talk about myself, maybe, a little bit. Um, for nearly 10 years, almost 10 years, I've been very lucky and privileged to work closely to President Chavez. Um, and then in 2010, I was appointed as ambassador in Brazil. I worked there for three years. Um, but I mentioned that because, yes, I was privileged to, to be a witness and to follow all the changes that have been taking place in Latin America for the last 10 years, 15 years, since 1999. All this process, all the changes for the better that took place in our continent. Um, then I, so I was in Brazil for three years, and then Prince Chavez passed away in 2013, and I went back to Caracas to, to work with uh, President Maduro. And then last year, I still remember, I was having a conversation with my president, and we were talking about the United States and how important you know, that we start to improve the relations and find the right balance in our conversation with the United States. And we're thinking, okay, we should do something about it. And then a couple of days later, um, I received a phone call from my president. He told me, oh, Maximilian, I've been thinking, I think you should go there. So I said, okay. Uh, so usually, our diplomats, when they go to the United States, they, they don't stay very long. Um, I said, okay, it's going to be a challenge. Um, so I arrived here in July last year, and uh, and I can tell you that being not an easy job for the last eight, nine months. But then one day I woke up and I read in the news that my country, Venezuela, has become a national threat to the United States. It is something, you know. Wow. Then I start to look at the list of the countries that have been, as well, designed, I mean, uh, shown as national threat to the United States. And I think there's nine or ten countries, I think. And uh, usually, it doesn't end, end very well for those countries. Um, so I was thinking, wow. I represent the national threat to the United States. Um, and I always thought to myself, but no, Venezuela is hope. We are trying to build something different, you know? Um, but then, yes, I have to say that a few weeks later, a couple of, few weeks later, yeah, a couple of days before the summit of Panama, you know, I was in, uh, in April. Have you, have you been following what took place in Panama? <laughs> that it was the first real summit of the Americas, of America, because we were all invited, including Cuba for the first time. Um, it was a big event. And also, it was very interesting to see that almost all the presidents that took part of the of the summit, they all said to President Obama, come on, Venezuela can't be a threat to the United States. I have to say that a couple of days before the summit, actually, President Obama did recognize that Venezuela was not a threat. We need to take back on that. Um, but, every, but then, obviously, nobody paid very much attention to that summit that was I think it took place on a Friday and Saturday, the 10th and the 11th of April. And that Sunday is when Hillary Clinton tweeted that she was going to be a candidate. And also it was on the same day that Game of Thrones launched. <laughs> so that was it on the news, you know, nobody paid attention to the, to the... That one day before, you have all the countries of the hemisphere 
get in Panama talking about the future of the continent. And also, yes, that for the first time we are in the same room, a president of Cuba and the president of the United States, you know, quite a big thing. And also, yeah, that nobody could understand how come this, we can say that Venezuela is a threat. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so we've been discussing and I've been discussing to my government, to the president, how we have become a threat, you know, all these things. Um, but yes, no, I believe Venezuela is a... Um, we are counting... Ah, there's a microphone coming. Test. 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 With the Manchester United. Is it okay? It works? Hello. Okay, I'm gonna... It's okay, it's okay, I can... I'm not supposed to move that much because there are two, micro, two cameras. No. Oh, wow. 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 Even in my country, as the Professor Lee said, literacy was eradicated in Venezuela. Extreme poverty was cut now to 5%, while poverty fell to 25%. 95% of Venezuelan people today eat three times per day. There was a picture in that presentation you have there from the La FAO, the World, the World Food Organization, giving uh, Maduro an award about that. Um, today, Venezuela, here we are in a university. Today, Venezuela has the second highest college enrollment in the region. Uh, housing increased by 40%. The number of senior citizens receiving pensions more than tripled. Social investment increased to about the two government spending. But yes, we do believe that we are a threat. We have in 15 years more than 19 elections. Every year there's an election in Venezuela. We're going to have a new election before the end of this year, parliament elections. Last year we had um, uh, local elections, yeah. Um, then the year before we had presidential elections, governor elections, again presidential elections, because when Prince Charles was elected. I mean, you know, every year. It's a problem sometimes to govern, you know, because every year we get election, we need to mobilize, to work. Um, <coughs> but yeah, we never talk about that, about all these things in Venezuela. When I arrived here in the United States, I've been doing some research. How can I explain, how can I explain to my friends here about what's going on in Venezuela? And I, I think to some extent, it's a combination with uh, the New Deal, you know, President Roosevelt in the 30s, last century, economic and social inclusion is what, we t what we've been trying to do in Venezuela, and also to some extent the civil rights movement in the 60s, also from last century, um, political inclusion. So I believe that what took place in Venezuela, what is taking place in Venezuela for the last 10 years, is a combination of this two historical movement that we've been through here in this amazing country. Civil rights movement. For the first time in Venezuela, you have the vast majority of people that before they were regarded as second rank citizens, that suddenly now they have become third citizens with rights, but also duties and obligations. And nowadays, when, if you have the opportunity to go to Venezuela, you will find an amazing society where all the sectors of the population, higher, middle, <coughs> lower classes, working classes, everybody is engaged, committed, talking about politics. You know? When you think that in our last local elections, more the turnout, turnaround was more than, was around 80% to elect a mayor. 80% people <coughs> get mobilized. And I'm saying that because in Venezuela, it is not um, compulsory to vote. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so that's very important. And political and social inclusion, and economic and social inclusion, and I, I refer to the New Deal, uh, because well, what I said just before, all this amazing social progress that we have been through. And again, because political willingness. Um, so that's quite important. And so we've been deepening democracy with the participation, participation of the people. We've been democratizing the communication. We always talk here about the lack of freedom of speech, the lack of freedom of expression in Venezuela. And on the contrary, but you think I've got already two microphones. You're going to do the first one. Wow! Even in CNN, they don't do that, right? This is better than CNN. Yeah, yeah they do, but I mean, so here it's okay? Oh, yeah. It's to balance my body. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not nervous. Okay. So now, what, what does it change? Uh, you know what? The closer uh, up here. Is. Hello. Okay. No, uh, I can carry it, you know? Yeah, I don't know if that works. I don't think it's on. I don't think it's on. Is it on? Um, yeah, no, it is on. Uh, I mean, it's okay, you know? We've been struggling until now, we can carry it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so and friend. there's seats okay, up sorry. front. Move down if you can. Yeah, here. It's okay, don't worry. John, it's okay. <laughs> So I was talking about deepening democracy. You know, in Venezuela, for the first time, we've been both discussing and voting our constitution that took place in 2000. For nearly six months, everybody. You could go everywhere in Caracas, in all the country, people were discussing our new constitution. And then we went to a referendum, that was in December 2000. 2000. And for the first time, we've been able to vote for our constitution. Um, that was an important moment. And in our constitution, we talk about democracia participativa participatory democracy and the idea that in order to take decision we need to have the participation participation of all the citizens. Um, another very important as I mentioned before, the democratization of communication. Again, if you know that two Venezuela, one virtual, particularly the internet and in the mainstream media, and the real Venezuela when you go there. And that's quite, impo that's quite amazing, you know, that these two different Venezuela. And um, yes, for the first time you got some of sectors of the Venezuelan population that they get access to the media that not only, not the media, not, they don't talk only about one sector of the population, but they talk about all the society. Um, another point, mm -hmm. regaining sovereignty. You know, thanks to the Bolivarian Revolution, we've been able to rediscover our nation. Where do we come from? Frank Chavez was a wonderful teacher a wonderful pedagogue. He was an, histo an historian. And what always amazed me from him that he was able to look the past and our history in order to move forward. That was very important. And I think this, this idea to rediscover the nation, it was being characterized most of the process that had been taking place in Latin America in the last 10 years. Not only in Venezuela, but in Ecuador, in Bolivia, to certain <coughs> in Brazil, in Argentina. You know, people start to be proud of our history and where we come from. That's something that I believe Prince Chavez was one of the first to show us that. 
Um, and because I mentioned his idea of Bolivar, obviously another very important concept that we've been fighting for and promoting is, is the idea of regional integration and solidarity. When you imagine where, how was Venezuela and Latin America 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and where we are now, we got UNASUR, CELAC, Mercosur, you know, ALBA, Petrocaribe. And I have to say that most of these important new forum or um, regional uh, bodies, Venezuela was one of the key players in their creation. And then, um, promotion. So that's something quite, quite new. And I believe that's one of the reasons why, for example, when President Obama goes to Panama, well, he has to listen to all these presidents showing solidarity to Venezuela and saying this continent has changed. You know? Obviously, we are all very pleased about what's taking place right now between the United States and Cuba. You know? Very important. But we believe that also that's a result of all the changes that have been taking place in our continent in the last 10, 15 years. So, as I was saying that we went through an important social transformation and political as well in Venezuela. And what is important that there's elections, as I said every year, but a bit like during the civil rights movement here, you, know, you have some sectors of the society, of the population, that for them it's very difficult to accept this kind of change and to realize that, yes, you've got also the vast majority of the people that want to be part of the society. And sometimes you've got a kind of violent reaction with that. Um, so, you know, in 2002, you had a coup against my government, against Prince Chavez, that did last only for two days. That was on, in April 2002. And thanks to an amazing mobilization from the army and from the people, Prince Chavez was back. Um, and from time to time, you got some people that, you know, they cannot accept the result of the polls, the result of the elections, and we try something, you know. So, for example, last year we went through a very difficult moment. I believe some people thought that when Prince Chavez died, that was, that was going to be the end of the Bolivar Bolivarian Revolution. You know, a strong leader, very charismatic, died. How can we carry on, you know? It's impossible. So, <coughs> we have to remember that a couple of months after his death, we have a, a presidential elections. President Maduro was elected. Um, it was a difficult election because we were all, um, you know, recovering. Uh, from the death of from Chavez. Um, it was a, a difficult moment for, for Venezuelans, for my country. And, uh, and when you go to election, usually you go, you know, with a kind of fighting spirit, you know, and a kind of, but, you know, we were, um, yes, recovering, you know, in, in Luto. Um, and then, so the result was, again, Maduro was elected with, I think, 51% of the vote against 49. The kind of result you will find in any European country, for example, but because it is Venezuela, so, oh, my God, something fishy took place there, you know? But okay. And then six months later, in December 2013, we have the election for mayors, local elections, 
Uh, it's very interesting because at that moment, the Venezuelan opposition decided to transform that local election as a kind of national referendum. This time we're going to show to the people, to the world, that yes, we have the majority. So the election took place in December, and again, huge participation, more than 80%, and the result was 55% of the votes for the PSU, the party of the Bolivar Revolution, and 45 for the opposition. And I don't, know, I don't have the numbers of towns and cities that but the large majority went to the party of President Maduro. Um, so again, an important result. And um, yes, okay, result of the election, that, that democracy. A few weeks later, a few days later, the result we have an important meeting that took place in Caracas with President Maduro, <coughs> where he invited all the, all the new elected mayor, including from the opposition. <coughs> I was at that meeting, actually. <coughs> that was the meeting where President Maduro said, OK, we got our differences, but let's try to move on and identify areas where we can work together. Because you know, it is, we've got some problems, that's true, and we need to work all together to resolve them. So that was in December 2013. And then, a few weeks later, suddenly, you have a little tiny group of people from the opposition that decided to go to the street of Caracas, and they decided to say, to stay there until my government resigned. This event took place mainly in the higher, upper classes, middle classes, you know, of Caracas and other places of Venezuela. Um, they were described by the mainstream media as a student <coughs> protest. <coughs> it was very interesting because I was, I was in Caracas at that moment and obviously everybody was talking about Kiev in Ukraine and all these events that had been taking place before in Egypt and you know. So as soon as you got a group of people gathering in a square, they think, oh, a revolution is taking place there, and the government must be very bad. Um, but yes, but that was not exactly the case in Venezuela, because this demonstration was not exactly led by peaceful student. And uh, it was very easy to see that something, something else was going on at that moment. And yes, a coup was on its way in Venezuela during these days. An attempt to destabilize the normal, the, a government, an attempt to show to the world, look at this government that is repressing all these peaceful students, the point that there was really an attempt to overthrow a legitimate and democratic government. How come? Well, when you think they targeted only public um, offices, they started to interrupt the validity of the street of Caracas and quite, in quite a veiled manner. And unfortunately, 43 Venezuelan citizens died during these weeks. But including 10 members of the armed forces or security officers. But you see, again, it was, they call that moment la salida, no? The way out. We will stay until the government resigned. And I think that if something like that might take place in any country in the world, including here, obviously the state will react and make sure that the citizen can have a normal life and not to be interrupted by a minority of people. And that was, that's, that's what we did. And these 43 people who died, some of them including, they have nothing to do with the demonstrations or whatever. 
and uh, we all feel very sorry for them. Very sad moment. And yes, we have a couple, few leaders, political leaders, that were involved in that coup. And now we have to respond to the Venezuelan justice. Right now, I'm speaking, as I'm speaking, we've got a couple of women that were in Washington, D.C. And they just received an award from the NED, a kind of prize to fight for democracy and for. And one of these ladies, her husband, was one of the main leaders of this coup last year. I prefer President Maduro to receive an award from the World Food Organization than from the NED. Um, I should mention that more than 3,000 people were arrested during this um, riot or whatever they call that, during this, this coup. And right now, only 39 people are still in jail. And from these 39 people, half of them they belong to the police or to the armed forces or to the National Guard. Half of them. And there's only one person that we could say is a student. <laughs> yes. But again, you will never see that in the New York Times or... Um, so, it's interesting. Do you know if... Um, so, to so be present my country as a, you know, a national threat, that we don't, we don't respect human rights. When you look at our history, and where, we do, where do we come from? You have to remember, for example, in Venezuela, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, all the violations of human rights that took place. In 1989, we have what we call the Caracaso, February 89. I believe that more than 5,000 people were disappeared, were killed, and most of them by the armed forces. And we didn't have any sanction built against Venezuela at that moment. We didn't have any executive order against Venezuela at that moment. <coughs> you know? But yes. Um, so, where we are now? Obviously, we are going through uh, some difficult moments. Venezuela is an oil producer country. Nobody could have imagined six months ago, eight months ago, that the price of the barrel of oil will drop from $100 to $40. That's something, you know. Uh, not a good moment to be a uh, president or to govern a country that, you know, uh, needs his main income. Because that's the truth, you know, Venezuela is an oil producer. There's nothing we can do about it, you know. Um, so, yeah, so a difficult moment, but he obliged us to diversify our economy and to be more, let's say, creative. Um, but again, what is it very important that this year we're going to have a parliament election? And again, is where, where I believe the vast majority of Venezuelan people want our differences to be resolved through elections, not through violence, through, you know, that's a very important. This coming Sunday, on the 17th of May, our opposition, we're going to have their, how do you say, primaries. Um, and we are very pleased about that because they ask our electoral body to organize them. So again, 
when you read the press and you, you see the mainstream media, they always say that in Venezuela, you know, we cannot trust the, the electoral the, the, the courts, the justice. And, but yeah, it was, you see, it seems that the Venezuelan opposition sometimes they, 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 they you know, for them, um, our electoral body is good only when we, when they win elections, not, not when they lose. I mean. But so, but it's a good example of a democracy. The fact that you know primaries will take place, and uh, those who identify themselves with the Venezuelan opposition will have, will, they're going to be able to elect their candidate for the next election. And the PSU, the party of the of the revolution, I think. They're going to have a primaries in, Jul in June, July, and, uh, and again, yeah, we will have elections um, at the end of the, the year. And uh, we are taking some important measure because we are confronting uh, some difficult moment on the economic front, as I said before, $100, $40, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, to, and also, one thing I didn't mention that, yes, we went through uh, also kind of sabotage of our economy. For those who know history, remember what took place in Chile in the early 70s before the coup, you know, to create other cows, shortages, you know, with this idea that uh, you can identify a socialist country because there's a lot of queue there. Well, it's not exactly that. And definitely you've got sectors of the economic, of the sectors that have been working against my government, promoting all these shortages, and now we deserve it. But we are fighting that. And, uh, and things are improving. And we believe that in the next few months, we managed to stabilize the situation. Um, I should mention that, that Venezuela also has been an important player, as I said, to promote solidarity and integration in all the region. We mentioned Petro Caribe, for example, very important for all our brothers from Haiti and Dominican Republic, Jamaica, you know, and also for Central America. El Salvador, judge on Petro Caribe last year, very important. Um, as you know, some important peace talks are taking place in Colombia right now. And again, Venezuela uh, is very, you know, we, we are following closely what's taking place there. If everything goes well, we might have um, a continent free of any armed conflict. Very important. Um, and uh, for those who think that promoting this stability in Venezuela, you will have something better. Just imagine how the change that will be taking place in my country if we don't resolve our differences through election, through democratic manners, it will be a chaos. It will be very dangerous, not only for Venezuela, but for most of the region. So, yeah, interesting times. I'm very pleased to see that you're interested in what's taking place in my country. I believe that we can have a kind of Q&A um, moment. Um, but before that, I would like to thank you, Professor Lee, Felix as well, Professor Felix, um, Stan Phil Smith, our consul, Jesus, has been helping me to promote this event. And let's hope next time when I come back, we're going to have a microphone. That's <laughs> <laughs> my voice right now. Um, don't be surprised about my French accent because I, was grow I grew up in France. So it's where I get this sea accent. Um, when I was a teenager. And uh, any question, whatever you want to know about my country, I'm here to respond to you. Let's take a break.
I just want to point out that there's some materials in the back from the uh, uh, local solidarity committee on Venezuela. I think there's also some things there from the consulate um, that you're free to look at before you go. Again, I want to thank Dr. Felix Masu, who is, is, is not here, but he asked that we announce, and so I will because he helped put this together, that uh, on Wednesday, May 20th, um, in room 254 here at Schmidt, there will be a lecture by Piero Gliasius on Visions of Freedom, a book on Cuba, U.S., and South African foreign policy. Um, Professor uh, Gliasius is a, uh, uh, from John Hopkins University, has written several books, and this is sponsored by the Department of History, which is who sponsored this event, too. So uh, I believe also there's some flyers in the back if you're interested in that. I should just point out that uh, uh, in Chicago there's lots of superstars. I don't know if you noticed that Spike Lee was here today and had a press conference mm -hmm. and he explained about Chirac. Um, one interesting thing to me was he refused to take any questions. Um, but we're not going to do that tonight even though we have our own star here with the, with the ambassador. We are going to take questions. But let me, let me think that if Spike Lee refused to take the... He, know did, why? he did not take questions. But you know why? Because since do the right things, he always said that. Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> really, because once I, I went to uh, one of his talks. And he wouldn't take your question. Yeah, of course. And he said, no, no, no. Since do the right things, I don't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, but we will take questions. But uh, here's how we want to do this, because we have a full, full room. So we want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question. So you get your chance to ask a question, but you don't get your second or third question until everybody has an opportunity to ask their own. I realize that's not an equal time, um, but our guest speaker gets most of the time, and now we have questions. I'd also would like to take two or three questions at a time, um, because oftentimes the questions overlap, so when the response comes, uh, he can respond to all of them. Um, and also, there's one more superstar in the US from Chicago, which is Obama. And I think that you've seen the Key and Peele impersonations where he's got Luther, his anger translator. That was kind of my role here tonight. I also will be I also will be your question translator. If your question goes on and on and on, I will very civilly interrupt you and translate what you're asking so the speaker can understand what you're asking. So please think carefully. Um, and you have your own voice, you ask your question, but let's, let's have two or three questions um, and then the ambassador will respond, then we'll take two or three more and we'll stay for a decent while. Yes, sir. Can you translate to the, to the ambassador? I want to thank him for coming here to be <laughs> Thank you very much. As Luther. <laughs> a couple of, uh, yeah, let's take a few questions. So, uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for coming. And you, uh, you talked about the National Endowment for Democracy giving an award to yeah. several of the people who were involved last year in the attempted coup. And I remember in 2002, uh, I think it's the first time I remember really hearing about the National Endowment for Democracy because of their role in the coup that year. Um, for those that don't know, the National Endowment for Democracy (NED) is entirely funded by the United States government, um, mostly from the State Department, um, and uh, it includes the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and unfortunately, the AFL-CIO. And as an officer in my union, it's you know one of the saddest things about labor history that so often the union movement takes the side of U.S. foreign policy, as they did during the coup in 2002. But uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, can, can you give us the size of the proportions? How much money is the NED and the other non-governmental organizations, so-called non-governmental organizations from the US spending trying to destabilize things in Venezuela? Good, thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, no, él se, él se refería a 21 prisiones en California. California. 
22 prisons were built in California in the last 30 years. 13 universities were built in Venezuela in the last 15. Oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I saw the news recently that uh, Maduro announced that there's going to be nationalizations of food distribution in, in Venezuela, and I'm just I'm just curious, what's the extent of these proposed nationalizations, and how do you think this will uh, combat economic uh, sabotage? Another question. Somebody was over here. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, in the map that we saw coming in today, I noticed that there was one part wired out to the election in, that was given the elections. Guyana. So I'm curious, um, as Venezuela attempts to integrate with the Caribbean, particularly CARICOM, how are the relations going with Guyana and what's the future, given that there's still quite a bit of a territorial dispute? So you've got three questions. Yes. Um, Guyana, uh, I'm going to start with Guyana because I believe uh, there was an election taking place. Still right now. We're still right right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, again. <laughs> Uh, so elections took place in Guyana a couple of days ago, I think. And actually, I don't know. I feel very embarrassed. I don't know the result. They don't know yet either. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But whatever the result is, you know, we, we, uh, the point that in the previously there was not been an attempt to promote a kind of confrontation between Venezuela and Guyana. Um, it's interesting because everything started when Guyana gets its independence. Mm -hmm. um, and just a couple of years before the independence, which year was in the 60s? Yeah. The independent Guyana. 70s. In the 70s. Yeah. I thought it was in the 60s, but just before, a couple of years before, we have this decision in a court, I think in the UK, I mean, this controversy about. Um, um, between Venezuela and Guyana. And at that time, it was really a, this idea to um, confront this young nation, Guyana, to Venezuela um, as a kind of, uh, let's say, I mean, they were regarding us as the imperialist ones. You know? <laughs> It uh, was inter interesting that with Frank Chavez, um, yes, there's this controversy and that's been dealt at the UN. I think there's, um, I don't know the name exactly, but there is um, an appointed person by the sec general secretary full of this controversy. But uh, we've been trying to promote a reintegration with Guyana. And uh, our relation with the, previous, the, the current government, the last government, and the previous ones, and have been excellent. And uh, Guyana is part of UNASUR and part of all these inter, 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 in regional integrations, and we we support that. Um, and there's no way that people could say, do you know who always promote this idea that Venezuela is against Guyana? The right wing Venezuela, the position. Uh, it's quite interesting actually. But, um, and I'm sure that whatever the result is, we will carry on this process of integration. And yes, that controversy, that matter, will be discussed where it should be discussed, but not in a confrontational manner or whatever. No. So, yeah. The question about nation nationalization of Food. Distribution. Distribution, yeah. <laughs> difficult to nationalize <laughs> food. You know, Venezuela, Venezuela um, import, used to import 80% of what we consume. Mm -hmm. Again, um, that's part of the price to pay when you, when you are all producer. At the end of the day, it's always cheaper to import <coughs> than to produce. Um, Venezuela in the late 19th century was, uh, I would say, uh, 
uh, was producing cocoa and coffee, and then a couple of decades later, and even tobacco, they discover oil. That was in the 1914 or 19, and we became a huge field of uh, oil producer. I mean, yes, oil producer with derricks. Um, and you know, Venezuela become one of the most important oil producers in the world. Member, founding member of OPEC in the 60s. And, uh, and yes, and as I mentioned to you, um, it became very cheap to import and not to produce. And the consequences in Venezuela were terrible because we didn't have any more um, the culture in agriculture, paints and mineral, we don't produce anything. And you have all this migration from the from the the land to the cities, you know. So we got another problem in Venezuela that <coughs> things are cheaper than most of our neighbors. So you have to understand that most of the product that you get in Venezuela, you will pay sometimes 30, 40, 50 percent less than in Colombia or in Brazil. So an attractive job to do in Venezuela is to be a smuggler, you know, and to buy food in Venezuela and you take it to your neighbor. Okay? And recently we have discovered that 30 percent of what we import in Venezuela end up in Colombia. <laughs> Uh, because whatever we do, it's cheaper. It would still be cheaper in Colombia to get something from Venezuela. Then. So that's a real problem. So when President Maduro is talking about uh, nationalization, is uh, we are trying. He's talking about yes, trying to find the best way to guarantee that our vast majority, the vast majority of the people can get access to food. Because that's the other thing that. Yes, we've got some problems, but on the other hand, as I said to you before, uh, according to the World Food Organization from the UN, Venezuela now, we don't have any more hunger. Okay, that's very important to understand. So, right now, in Maduro, that's the main battle we are having in Venezuela, is to guarantee to the people access to the food. And uh, we're talking about when we say nationalization, we're talking about to establish a network um, to uh, facilitate the distribution. But again, we are not against the private sector. That's something very important to understand. It's not that we don't want anymore the private sector to produce or to develop the private sector as its part in our economy. And it's going to be like that. But yes, we want to make sure that the state can uh, guarantee to the people access to their needs. And uh, that's the reason we are talking about establishing a network um, of distribution. More question? There was a, f a first one, but, ah, the LED. You know, that kind of question, I don't know what to answer, because I think we need to wait 50 years to see, yes, from the, you know, when they, re when they, and classified, or maybe less than 50 years actually, yes. But so I don't know right now uh, how much the, through the NED uh, we said the little position that you received. Uh, but I'm sure you can find the answer. Let's take a few more questions. There actually, NED has their own website. And you can see at least what they publicly report on how much aid that they've given for democratic uh, promotion in Venezuela. And it's in the tens of millions. Um, but you can, that's, at least that's part of it that they will share. I'm sure that's there's more. One, that's just one of the NGOs. Yes, yes. Questions? Uh, the Latin American uh, Herald Tribune is reporting that there are uh, negotiations taking place right now in Caracas between the U.S. and Venezuela to unblock you as ambassador yeah. and to, um, uh, to, to uh, take away the uh, 
executive order that uh, calls uh, that puts sanctions on Venezuela and to reduce the uh, uh, number of uh, U.S. diplomats in uh, Caracas. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct reporting? Do you know what the results are of those negotiations so far, or what's happening? Yes, way back. Hello. I know you discussed your solidarity with the Caribbean, and you mentioned the summit, so I would like you to discuss a little bit more your solidarity with Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico's present political concerns. There is one? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think what the United States is doing against Venezuela is very serious. Just in the same way they're, they're trying to attempt to do the same thing with Cuba through these negotiations. And one of the things that, to me, that, seems, that they're trying to do is drive a wedge between Cuba and Venezuela. And I don't think either country is falling for it. Because it's to Venezuela's credit, you're still sending oil to Cuba. Yet, you know, you have a cri economic crisis in your country, so that's that's very important that that's being done. And I know that in Cuba, uh, six days after the uh, U.S. Uh, put the sanctions on Venezuela, Cuba held a solidarity conference with, with Venezuela. So the, the, what the United States is trying to do to divide your country is not working, in my opinion. Three great questions for somebody that does diplomacy. <laughs> U.S. Venezuelan relations, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Cuba, Venezuela. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> 30 seconds or less. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. All the time you want. No, uh, uh, um, so, you, do you read that in the Latin Eritrean? Yeah. Well, I'm still, a, I'm still a charge. I'm not yet an ambassador. So, um, but yes, uh, we're having discussion. This is not a secret. Uh, as you know, a few days before the summit. In Panama, I mean, that's public. Uh, a special envoy from Secretary uh, Kerry came to Caracas. And then during the summit in Panama, um, there was a, um, an informal meeting or conversation between President Obama and President Maduro for 15 minutes. I mean, again, that was public. Yeah. Not to be the meeting, but uh, being reported, and uh, and we are talking. We, we, you know, something very important is true that three days before the summit, President Obama did recognize that he doesn't regard Venezuela as a threat. That was quite uh, important to say, you know, and, uh, at least to admit. Um, so you know, we are talking, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we might have some. To, to show and to say to the world. Um, yes, maybe a contradiction to, in one way, we all celebrate the end of this last chapter of the Cold War when uh, President Baba and President Castro, because, you know, they did announce on the 17th of December the normalization of the relation, and we all we celebrate that. I think it's very important put an end to this situation that lasted for nearly 60 years. Uh, but then it would be a bit strange, a bit weird, a bit sad, to say the least, that then suddenly you open another chapter not quite nice with my country, you know? So that's the reason it's very important for all of you and for all of us to keep an eye on that and be on alert. Um, so, but as President Maduro said, we, we, we support that process of normalization between the US and Cuba. And we recognize uh, the courage and the, you know, of President Obama to have done that. And apparently next week we're going to start again to talk and very soon we might have ambassadors, a Cuban ambassador in Washington and and a U.S. ambassador in Havana. I hope that I can be their colleagues. <laughs> 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 About Puerto Rico, 
As I said to you, it was my first time, my first visit in Chicago, and this morning I went to uh, Pilsen, no, sorry, to Umbel Park. <laughs> Umbel Park? Yes. yes. And I was there and I saw an amazing flag, you know. In a, uh, I mean, I never see something like that. I thought it was a sculpture, but they told me, no, no, it's a Puerto Rican flag, you know. You know the one? Oh, yes. History. Yes. 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 Puerto Rican territory. So, so yes, and they told me, yes, uh, you are here in a, in a very pristine uh, place. So, I went there, I went to a, a restaurant called Nelly. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> pristine. I have uh, the best hot meal with cocoa milk. Um, and I have an interesting discussion with people there. Uh, Puerto Rico was invited in the CELAC mm -hmm. summit. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yes, we, we follow the situation very closely. Um, I mean, all the region, you know, all the region. We see what happens in the near future. But it was very interesting uh, to see that Puerto Rico was there at the select summit. Um, I'm a diplomat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Um, in the spirit of solidarity, uh, we know that. The U.S. Um, had a meeting yesterday, and it seems that uh, there is an overwhelming approval of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So in the spirit of solidarity, would it be possible that Venezuela and the region um, within Central and South America would be helping helping expose the effect of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement because for the Philippines, my country, the Philippines, we will be the launching pad leader of the Asian people. And there was already an announcement that there is a big possibility that the Subic um, naval base will again be open in the north. Of course, China is in the north. And in the south, the airfield which is like 30 minutes or 45 minutes from my, my father's house, will be used as an airfield in Mindanao, where we have the continuous uh, presence of U.S. Marines, like less than a thousand troops all over the Philippines. And Japan and the U.S. are in partnership with this possibility of having the list things again. And so this is very detrimental to the Filipino people and the detriment of the Filipino people is the, the detriment of many peoples of the world because this is again a very um, clear example of how you know US foreign policy is like bullying a country like ours which used to be an occupied and now still a semi-colony of the US. So we, would we be hearing uh, solidarity support from Venezuela and Okay. Yes, we're in the back. Uh, yeah, I have a, I guess, a pragmatic question. Um, I'm actually not from Chicago. I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and I'm just here for the week. But uh, in March, we started for the first time ever on the East Campus uh, Solidarity Organization with Venezuela called the Friends of Venezuela Society. Uh, and it's the first time we've ever had anything like it on East Campus. So uh, one of the peculiar dynamics of our campus, though, is that we have a small group of Venezuela. Solidarity work. What, what is uh, what's why? What's, what's 
What's the best way to go about it, I guess? Or just some pragmatic questions. Another question? I, I just wanted to speak to this because I think it would be difficult for somebody that's a Venezuelan citizen representing the Venezuelan government to make uh, suggestions to a solidarity committee in the United States. But I, I think I can speak. I think I could speak to that. And I would. T uh, Stansfield Smith standing in the back. There's a Chicago committee, and I think that you should talk with some people from the Chicago committee. I'm in a very small. Uh, uh, Hammond, Indiana, I'm not from Chicago either. But, um, I, I would say you're, they're right, you're not from Venezuela, but they're not from the United States. <laughs> we know more about what our government does and what our government is capable of than anybody else does. And we have a responsibility as American citizens to stand for the things that we've been raised to believe in, even if our government doesn't. So whether someone wants our act of solidarity or not is not really the issue because we're more aware of what the U.S. is capable of. I would also suggest that what you said before about the Venezuelan students that are at the U University of Toledo probably don't represent the general population of Venezuela. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that afterwards because we find ourselves in the same situation. Yes. The other question. You can answer it too. But I just didn't want to put you in. The, I didn't want to put him on the spot. To, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering about the Chicago Committee. What took place in Latin America in the last 10 years is a clear example that something else is different from all the neoliberal policies that have been taking place in most of the world in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and to show that, yes, something different can take place where people become the core of policies. This idea that the economic policies should serve the people and not the other way. Uh, an example where to show that it is very important to have a state to respond to the need of the people. So I think uh, the best way to, uh, right now, is to express uh, to respond to your question is, you know, just look at what happens in Latin America in the last 10, 15 years, and maybe that could be part of the solution. Um, but, you know, um, I think, yeah, is that's the reason we said Venezuela is not a threat, Venezuela is hope, in the sense that, yes, we are going through a difficult moment, that's for sure, you know, it's not easy to change a society, it's not easy to transform a society, but, uh, but it's possible. And uh, as long as you respond to the need and the demands of the people. And, uh, so that's how we we'll answer to you. We might not satisfy you. Another question? Yes. Um, when Joe was asking before about the NED and Venezuela, uh, Ava Gollinger, the person to read about that. She goes into that in great detail. I did some recent article in the Counterpunch magazine, counterpunch.org, that she said between 2000 and 2011, the U.S. had, uh, through these agencies like NED, spent $120 million in Venezuela. I don't know if that's as a whole. And our, our committee in Chicago to organize this event, we don't have any Venezuelans in it either. <laughs> but we are really like, we're against U.S. interference in Venezuela. That's what we're about. And we're against the media campaign to get disinformation against Venezuela. That's sufficient. <coughs> Because you're, I mean, I'm a college student, I don't really know much about the history of 
Venezuelan country. And I'm not from the United States, but I grew up here. And for me, it's still, I'm very unaware of what is going on. So for me, my question is, if you're not a threat, then what are you, what are you hoping for? <laughs> Well, we are hope for a duration. It's a most difficult question uh, <laughs> tonight and for the last few weeks. Uh, well, first, uh, you know, we are trying to build a more decent society in Venezuela. Um, more equal society where people can get access to free education, free health, no matter their background, no matter from, uh, where their parent, who their parents are. Equal opportunities is what we are trying to do. And a more decent society, yes. Um, where if you take a picture of Venezuela 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and now, just the street of Caracas, you see how things have changed. Um, people, just look at a rally of, if you take a picture of a, a Chavez rally, of Maduro rally, we see that most of the people who goes there, the color of a skin. And then you take a picture of um, a rally of uh, the opposition. They look more like mine. <laughs> <laughs> My family, they don't understand why we decide. Um, <laughs> But hope for, and with the United States, we hope that we can find a, a better way to, to deal with our differences, to learn to live a kind of pacific coexistence. Maybe we can agree on some certain issue. We might have our, we might disagree on others, but at least to find a, a way to handle them and um, through discussion and dialogue and not through confrontation <coughs> and, and threat. I think that's what we hope for. And again, to leave our people to decide their future. If tomorrow the Venezuelan opposition get the majority of the votes, well, I can guarantee you that uh, my president will be the first to accept the result and to resign. But first we need to get that. <coughs> Thank you very much for the question. Is is this focus on uh, economic salary? I was wondering, is there much resistance by the skilled uh, workers in the oil field? And I think what we came earlier was the time of status. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. I, if you're talking about the uh, summit, you know, the inclusion of uh, Puerto Rico and, um, you know, Obama, the way he tried to preempt the agenda by declaring Venezuela a threat and, you know, basically no one else was on board with it. Do you think that uh, kind of a underlying message there was, you know, the last two centuries or so of the Monroe Doctrine are done? <laughs> yeah, uh, my question is, I don't know if it's an easy one to answer, but... Obviously, there's a difference between our countries and that our military, um, our budgeting or spending on militaries that, um, that is just out, out of control, and we barely have any social spending. I'm wondering, in percentage-wise, can you kind of pop about that in your country? Like, 
because I think that has a big, there's a huge difference, I think, in terms of where the money goes here. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same way you see it there. Um, so about the, the economic sabotage and the oil industry, you have to remember that after the, the attempted coup, I mean, the failed coup in 2002, a few months later, um, there was um, what say, a strike um, on the oil industry. Not only the oil industry, I mean, it's really amazing. You, you know, usually when, when you have a strike that takes place, um, on personal, on, you know, I'm, I'm, for me, I'm very proud to be here in Chicago because of the first of May and the hay market. And you know, usually you think workers they go on strike to fight for their rights and for you know, but in Venezuela it was the. Yes, yes. Yeah, lockout from. Uh, you know, decided by the CEO. the CEOs, by the chairmen, by the Los Patrones. Uh, so that was strange, you know, because suddenly we decided to lock up, you know, to close the factory, to close the shops, to close the markets, to close the restaurants. And yes, PDVSA, our main, our, 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 our national company, uh, old company. Um, I can imagine for nearly two months, it was a big battle, and not a single all um, yeah, it was produced. And not only that, they did sabotage most of our installation. You know, some of our refineries plants, some of our, you know, uh, yeah. And I think, can you imagine, workers were, I mean, not workers, sorry, uh, white, what do you say, the white, white uh, uh, yeah. You know, with a computer trying to play around and to sabotage the refining plant. So what exactly took place in Venezuela during these months? That was in 2002-2003. Difficult moment, um, but we won. And we did recover the Levesa and our industry at that moment. After a long battle. But then not a single dollar gets in Venezuela during all these days. It was a difficult moment, and I think more than 15,000 people from Pervesa, they left Pervesa after the, the sabotage. Uh, and then we didn't do too bad without them. Um, and, um, but it was a, a very tricky moment. And, and now, when I was talking about the economic sabotage, um, you know, when you look at history, you know, and the best way to promote discontent within the population, uh, again, promote short shortages and get difficulty access to the dollars in, all the world, in, in, in the market, you know. When you read the financial press, they keep saying that Venezuela is on the edge of a bankrupt, of a default, sorry. They've been saying that for the last 10 years. <laughs> um, so the question was, sorry? Yes, so I remember President Chavez was always talking about two different concepts of, of America, or of, of you know, the Monroe Doctrine and Bolivar Doctrine. Um, let me, I think Secretary Curry said a few months ago yeah. that the Monroe Doctrine was over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Secretary Curry said so, you know. <laughs> 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 no, a lot of respect for him. <laughs> no, really. <I'm> <laughs> We see, I mean, again, uh, uh, this, this, you know, this summit in Panama, again, was historical. We are talking about, for the first time, we were all, all the, all the region were together. So we could say there was the first real summit of the Americas. The first one. And thanks to all of us, including the United States, who have accepted the president of Cuba. No, no,
you know. Um, the, um, and there was one, I, I love Bahia. Um, People were trying, they wanted to separate the, but you know, yeah, but Salvador de Bahia, 70% of the population is Afro. And there was a picture of the demonstration of that day in Salvador de Bahia, and you thought it was Sweden. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but no, but, but the point is, um, uh, obviously, you know, Brazil is like a continent. Uh, is huge and it's very important for all Latin America. Uh, so they cannot do anything. They cannot. Not exactly, but that is different because just because the size and what Brazil represents, mm -hmm. you know, you're part of the Brics, uh, part of this new 21st, this new world that we're trying to build, the 21st century. You know, Brazil is a very important player. So obviously, Things are different, but when I read the news, uh, some of my friends in Brazil, they said to me, wow, it seems that the Brazilian opposition has been learning a lot from the Venezuelan opposition. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, um, but, it, but it's an interesting process as well. I mean, what took place in Brazil in the last 10 years, very interesting as well. Um, about the economy, what I was saying that, and I think your question, yes, yes. yes um, the, the, the difference between the IMF and the Chinese, the, there's no precondition. You know, you don't have a, a kind of, uh, let's say, um, there's not a Beijing consensus to follow. With, that's the difference with the IMF. Um, the IMF allowed to give, uh, let me say, um, uh, more, uh, demands. Huh? Demands. demands. No, yes, there are the demands. Yeah, yeah, demands, and then we give, you say, oh, you're a good student, you're a bad student, you know. And they, <laughs> great. They, they, yeah, great, <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> uh, and then you got Christine Lagarde who said, oh, I'm very worried about the Do you never hear that? From somebody from China or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I think that's a big difference, that uh, we have an excellent relation with China. Um, we have um, a strong partnership, but, but you know, um, it's not that we are trying to change from one, uh, you know, as you're saying, I mean, I don't think so. I think it's quite different. And about the economy, again, it's what we are trying to do. As, as, you, as you said yourself, yes, um, El Petrol, you know, the oil, create this, um, um, this dependency and we lost, our, we lost people in our farmers, you know, because it was far more attractive to go to the cities and to the towns and to get an easy job, maybe, then we need to walk. I mean, that, was, that took place in the 20th century in Venezuela, no? El Exodo Rural. And, and again, um, one of our problems in Venezuela, we didn't have a, a proper, what do you say, bourgeois entrepreneur, you know? Bourgeoisia. <coughs> Experts, so yeah, they, they, they just import. <coughs> they just been importing, and thanks to the state, actually, it's not like in Brazil, for example, or Argentina, that you have a kind of bourgeoisie that started to develop their own means of production. That was not the case of Venezuela, and that's been one of the problems. And what we're trying to do in the last 15 years with Chavez and now with Maduro, of course, is to diversify our economy and trying to. To um, not to depend only of <coughs> our oil industry and and, 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 and and the price of the barrel, um, but it's, it's it's quite difficult. Um, and when you look 
look at all countries of producers, it's not easy at all. But that's what we're trying to do. And one of the reasons why we are promoting integration, because we do believe that, yes, complementing each other with Brazil, for example, with Argentina, with uh, Ecuador, we, we will be able to respond and ways to uh, diversify our economy. What I mean that uh, Venezuela could produce many, many things to the north of Brazil, for example. Um, and uh, so that's what we're trying to do. But it's a, a difficult task. When I hear the questions, it strikes me that uh, this crowd is as knowledgeable as the United States Congress. <laughs> Your questions are well informed. Um, it's 8.30. Um, uh, if we want to have other questions, Jesus Rodriguez is here, Carlos Ron is here from the, uh, from the consulate. Um, the ambassador will stay um, so you can have other, other questions. I, I, just, I just felt like I wanted to respond to her question for hope. I keep looking at the clock and it strikes me since we started to this minute, 30,000 kids have starved to death in the world. That doesn't have to be. The richest 435 people in the United States have as much wealth as the 90% of the rest of us. They don't have homeless people in Cuba. They don't have people without medicine in Cuba. They don't pay for college in Chile or Denmark or Sweden. That's hope for a better future. Venezuela may have problems, but Venezuela has taken what Cuba started to another step. We, as American people, could take it to a step that would change human history and our relationship to the environment. That's a hope, and that's inspiration. And we can't answer all the questions here, and I wouldn't ask a diplomat from any country to tell us everything. Um, I would say you could go to venezuelanalysis.com as a start, um, get some material off of the back. I see that uh, Professor uh, Felix Massoud is here. A round of applause, thanking him for being That is a rapid applause. Let's have a larger applause for a man that should be the ambassador.